Uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Ward. I'm the Policy and Communications Director here at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at London School of Economics and Political Science. As you can see, we don't go in for short titles for our uh, institutions. Um, thank you for coming along to this very special event on a Friday afternoon. It's obviously a very special day across the world where students are being joined by adults all over the world to make their voices heard and to call for action on climate change. And uh, we're very grateful that you've decided to join us this afternoon for uh, a conversation about practical ways in which we can all help to stop climate change both directly and through the power of persuasion. I'd like to particularly welcome the school students we have here this afternoon who are visiting LSE. And um, I'm trying to work out, are you all from London? If you're a school student in London, can you put your hand up? Okay, so that's my students. Um, we will be joined throughout the event by people coming along, including, I think, people who have been on, on participating in the student strike. The second half of the event is a panel discussion which includes two people who have been on strike in uh, Seven Oaks, and I'm hoping they will arrive in time for the, <laughs> for the second half of the event. <laughs> but what we're going to have to begin with is um, three pre short presentations and then we'll have a panel discussion. But first of all, I just need to run through uh, a bit of housekeeping. The first is that if you have a mobile phone, can you turn it off or turn it to silent so that it doesn't go off in an embarrassing way during the middle of the event? Welcome, everybody. Uh, the second is that um, we're not expecting a fire drill during the course of the afternoon. So if the alarm goes off, please follow directions to the exit and they will, you will be directed outside at the assembly point. Um, the name of the game today is to have an interaction. So I hope you will all be thinking during the course of the presentations, during the panel discussion, mm -hmm about questions you can ask. And I'm going to unashamedly give preference to the school students when it comes to questions. So uh, please do be thinking about what your questions are. We're also going to um, have each of the panelists and the speakers tell you where they went to secondary school as well just so that we build up a picture here of the diverse set of backgrounds that people have come from. So I'll start. It was a long time ago, but when I went to secondary school, it was in South End in Essex, and I went to South, South End High School for boys. Um, I'd been in, uh, at school in Canada before that, so it was a bit of a shock coming back to a place that had uniforms and was um, a single-sex school. But each of the panelists and the um, speakers will be... Uh, telling you about their school, uh, secondary school. So let me just tell you who we've got speaking. We're very lucky. We're going to start with uh, Nicholas Stern, who is the chair of the Grantham Research Institute and professor of economics and government here at LSE. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he might be, be best remembered on climate change for a very important report. He was commissioned by the UK government to produce back in 2006 on the economics of climate change. And Nick has remained a very influential um, in, um, figure in the discussion about climate change policy, both in the UK and around the world. He is, for instance, a member of the steering group for the United Nations Secretary General's special summit, which is taking place on Monday in New York, and which the uh, actions today are designed to add um, to give force to. Then we'll hear from Georgia Gould, the leader of London Borough Council. You're technically inside Camden Borough at the moment, so she'll be talking about what action should be happening in Camden to stop climate change. And then we'll have a uh, presentation from Anne Jones, who's the um, vice chair of the National Federation of Women's Institutes, 
for those of you who don't know, the Women's Institute is by far the most influential um, network in the country, and she'll be talking about some of the work that they're doing on climate change. Each of the speakers is going to speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll have a chance for questions from the audience. Uh, so I'm going to start by uh, inviting uh, Nicholas Stern to come and uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. And thank you all very much for coming to the LSE. And I hope that we'll see some of you um, here as students in the, in the future. Um, now, um, was I supposed to say what school I went to? Yes. Um, I went to a school in Hammersmith um, called Latima. Um, it was then um, essentially a grammar school. Um, and it subsequently became a fee-paying school. And um, so that was downhill, but it went um, uphill when it admitted women, which was, uh, uh, well, <laughs> probably about 20-some years ago. Um, anyway, that's where I went. Um, the, uh, what I want to do now is I want to do three things. First is to underline just how urgent all this is, and it really is urgent. Second is to show how there's a way forward that is actually very attractive, including cities where you can move and breathe and ecosystems which are robust and fruitful and so on. But we have to change, we have to change radically to make that happen. And the third is how you uh, can put pressure on the older generation. Um, and there are various ways that uh, you can do that. Actually, um, having had three children and now five grandchildren, I understand uh, quite uh, sharply and deeply how young people can put pressure on older people. But what you want to do is to do it in a systematic, effective way that drives us all in a good direction. So, why is this so urgent? Well, actually, you have had an education about climate change. People 15 years older than you would not necessarily have seen that through school. I mean, Greta Thunberg, um, who's been, done such a grand job, learned about climate change in school. People 15 years earlier wouldn't necessarily have had that. So you are actually in a much more powerful position in terms of understanding and education than earlier generations. But essentially, you know that certain molecules oscillated at frequency that interferes with infrared energy that uh, bounces back off the surface of the Earth. So it interferes with them, it traps them, it's like a blanket, and uh, stops the heat escaping. So essentially, it's the concentrations of greenhouse gases that cause the warming, and the more the concentration, the more is trapped, and the more the warming. So if you want to stabilize temperatures, you've got to stabilize concentrations. And if you want to stabilize concentration, well, that means net zero. If the level is constant, then the flow into it has got to be net zero. It's got to be balanced. Um, you know, it's just like you want a stable level in the bathtub. Now, how many people have baths anymore? But if you want a stable level in the bathtub, you know, you've got to have as much going in the top uh, through the taps is going out the plug hole. And normally you stop the plug hole and turn off the tap, so you've got naught and naught, and it stays stable. But essentially, net zero is not some cuddly nice to have. Net zero it follows inexorably from the physics. You've got to have net zero if you're going to stabilize concentrations, and you, if you want to stabilize temperatures, you've got to stabilize concentrations. And the earlier you go net zero, the lower at which you stabilize temperatures. So roughly speaking, if we want to stabilize at 1.5, we've got to go net zero in 2050. If we want to stabilize at 2, maybe 20 years later than that. So that's the story, broadly, of what we have to do. Well, you can see that we're emitting something more than 50 billion tons CO2 equivalent now. We've got to get that down to zero. And you don't get that down to zero just by, say, stopping growing, because that stays at 50-some billion. You get it down to zero only by radical change in the way that you do things. And you can see one way of looking how fast we have to go is that even for 1.5, 
And you know, that's not that safe. But even for 1.5, you've got to get down to net zero by 2050. Another way of looking at it is the world economy will likely double in the next two decades or so. That's just a growth rate of around 3%. If you look at Asia, it'll probably grow at 5 6%. Rich countries, 1 2%. Average growth rate, probably about 3%. Doubles in two decades. In those two decades, just for two degrees, let alone 1.5, which we ought to be aiming for, but just for two degrees centigrade, you can, uh, you're going to have to cut emissions absolutely by 40%. So double the economy, same time, in those two decades, reduce emissions by 40%, just for two degrees. Much more for what we should be aiming for is 1.5. Now, these one degree, two degrees, three degrees sound pretty abstract. Well, we're heading now, even with all the Paris commitments, for well over two degrees. Sorry, for well over three degrees. We haven't been at three degrees uh, as a world for about three million years. Homo sapiens is 250,000, one quarter of a million, year, a million years. So we're headed, if we're heading for three degrees, way, way outside human experience. Hundreds of millions of people would probably have to move. The last time we were at three degrees centigrade, um, sea levels were 10 to 20 meters higher than now. This is the, these are the stakes that we're playing for. Hundreds of millions, probably billions of people would have to move, and probably a very large number of those even at two degrees. So those are the stakes that we're playing for. So we're in a hurry, and the stakes are big. Now, here comes the positive story. <laughs> The positive story is that we can do something. We really can do something about this. We can have zero carbon electricity. We can see exactly how to do that with current technologies of renewables and wind and solar and so on. We've got lots of storage so we can smooth out any fluctuations in the sunshine and the wind. Um, so we can design our cities so that um, they're mostly uh, walking and bikes and electric buses in the center of them. We can have that. And that is much, much more attractive than what we've got now. We can restore degraded land. You restore degraded land, you capture the carbon in the soil, you make it more productive, and you make it more resilient to bad weather. These are all ways forward that are enormously attractive, and we can see them. And there'll be lots more along the way because we're going to discover, we've been discovering quite extraordinarily rapidly over the last 15 years, and as we push further in this direction, we'll discover much more. This is a very attractive story of much higher living standards, a better way of living, a story that fights world poverty, that delivers on the Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah, most of you probably know the badge I'm wearing, it's the Sustainable Development Goals. That defines the world's fight against poverty on a whole range of dimensions. So that is a story that is enormously attractive. We know how to do it, and it's beginning to be done. Now, Denmark and um, India, just take two very different countries, have decided not to sell, not to allow the selling of uh, internal combustion engine cars after 2030. There's a tremendous amount we can do. We can make our economies much more resource efficient. Uh, if you like the circular economy, you design everything from the beginning so it can be dismantled and reused. Now, you can make a lot of your building and other kinds of materials and other kinds of structures out of what is essentially, you know, Lego. Lego is the one thing that has lasted across it. But you can dismantle it and put it back together again. If you, if you put a load of concrete around steel girders, try getting those steel girders out. But we can do these things much better. So there's so many ways into this. Renewable energy, different functioning of cities, restoring of land, the circular economy, which makes everything uh, reusable. That's much more than recycling. It's reusable. It's still more powerful than recycling. So there's so much we can do, and it's enormously attractive. So what do you guys do? Well, you give the people taking the decisions a hard time, and I'll come back, I'll close in just a, a minute or so on the politics. Your politics is very powerful. Um, but you can do more than that. You can think about the way you travel. You, know? you can bike, and you can walk, and you can uh, 
take um, public transport. You know, if you're rich enough, you can get an electric scooter and uh, persuade the government that it ought to make it easier to use electric scooters. There are so many things that you can do in your own life that actually cut back, and most of them will actually make your life uh, uh, easier. You can think about what food that you eat. We know that factory-produced uh, meats oriented around uh, soya made from um, uh, pla made in places that were, as it were, arose from cutting down a forest is very destructive. So you can think about what you eat. Um, there's so many things that you can do in all this, um, and there will be, and I know it's very difficult for you to think about this, but how many people have been thinking about their pensions? <laughs> See, that, that leaves you behind. But when you go to work, which is not far away, it's not far away, you will have defined contribution schemes. That means that there'll be a pension pot, which is your pot, got your name on it, and into that pot goes whatever you put into that pot. I got a defined benefit scheme, which was if I were to survive, I would get some fraction of my final salary. It's actually a good deal, but it's not available to you. You've got a defined contribution scheme. So you've got to decide where that money goes. As you get a job in your 20s and you start to earn salaries and it goes into these pots, you decide what happens to it. So that's a very powerful, so put it in a defined contribution scheme that offers you some kind of future fund which is um, responsible. So the power of the money and where the money goes. And of course, choose which, which firms do you buy from? Do you want to buy from a reckless firm that's polluting all over the place? Or do you want to buy from a firm that's trying to make a difference? And where do you go to work? Paul Polman ran Unilever for 10 years and turned it into a firm that really cared about its uh, supply chains and so on. They get two million job applications a year. They get the best people. So the firms are really waking up. They respond to where people want to work. They respond to where people want to buy their stuff. And of course they respond to who wants to invest in them, which you can control too through your pension pots. There's lots you can do. But above all, and this is where I'll finish, you can do what you're doing today. You can bring political pressure. And that's enormously important. Politicians react to pressure. Why were all the people contending for the leader of the Tory party signing up to a climate action story? Because they were interested in votes, and they were interested in votes particularly of young people. So your vote counts, your voice counts, and you have to let people know what moves you, what matters, and why it matters. And there are many things that matter, and what you're speaking up for is something that matters to everybody. Now, it, you're speaking up for something that's not simply how much do I get paid and how fast does it rise. There are times in your life you're going to have to speak up for that. But what's wonderful what you're doing is you're not doing that now. You're asking about the future, not only of yourselves, but the future of everybody, because we know climate change depends on emissions and it depends on the total of emissions and the atmosphere doesn't care whether a kilogram of carbon dioxide came from um, uh, Johannesburg or London or Beijing or wherever. So you're speaking up for everybody and I salute you for doing it. But keep at it, keep at it strongly and if you excuse the metaphor, keep, the f keep our feet to the fire. Thank you. We, we've got time for just uh, a couple of very quick questions. Now, I should have said this at the start. This is being live streamed on the web at the moment. So you're, uh, <laughs> if you ask a question, be aware you're going to be on, on the web. We're also recording this, and we'll be putting it on our website later. So anybody got any questions? Uh, I'm going to invite you to... Um, also say your name and where you're from. So anybody want to ask a question? This gentleman here at the front? You just, uh, if you just wait for a microphone to come to you, that, yeah. 
Very good. Uh, hi, my name is James Appiah. I go to St. Bonaventures in East London. And I wanted to ask, you said that we should apply pressure to politicians. So what do we say to politicians that say climate change is a hoax? Um, well, you invite them to publish their results in the scientific journals, which would be, I'm sure, enthralled to see what new evidence they've got. And of course, they haven't got it. Um, you, you challenge them on the science. You say, look, I've been educated. I've read these things. I understand them. If you've got some new results, you publish them and uh, challenge them to give the evidence which um, they claim overturns 200 years of climate science. Now, I don't expect them to say, oh, thank you very much, James, now I get it. But that's the only kind of, you've got to reply on the evidence and uh, challenge them on the evidence. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. And one more. Oh, and sorry, did you want to come back on that, James? Or? No, that's yeah. right. No, okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, the, have we got any female students? I, I, we have a tradition here at LSE of uh, gender balance conversation. So <laughs> I'm not, we're going to stay here until we have a question from a woman. <laughs> yeah, this at the front. Yes, please hold up. You just wait for a microphone yeah, in the green shirt. Thank you very much for asking. Uh, I, my name's Alex. I go to um, UCL Academy 6 form in Swiss Scottish. And I wanted to ask, um, what about um, Donald Trump, who is obviously the president of the richest country in the world, and who is adamant that climate change is a hoax? Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, I tried with James to say, look, you, you've got to be evidence-based, you've got to challenge and say this is what the science says, this is how it works, and you know how it works, and if you've got some evidence that overturns that, you uh, put it on the table. But you can also draw his attention to the fact that uh, there's a uh, United States which has got California um, where um, they have had strong environment policies for a very long time, and they've done very well, and they're really moving on this. You can point him to you know, firms like Walmart and Google, which are fully committed to this story. So I say, well, I have to remind you, President Trump, that there's a very large part, and a rather distinguished, educated, effective part of your country that's got this, and it's doing things that really matter. You will pass, they will not. Excellent, excellent question. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. And I, I'm going to invite Georgia Gould to uh, now talk to us about what should Camden do to stop climate change. And uh, she's going to start by telling us which school she went to, which secondary school. Yeah, so I went to Camden School for Girls, which is not too far from UCL Academy. Um, and uh, Camden School for Girls was set up by a woman called Frances Mary Buss, who was a suffragette and a, and a pioneer in female education. It was one of the first um, free girls' schools, and it has a great kind of history of producing feminist and campaigning women. And I know a lot of Camden School for Girls students are marching today um, out, out, out of Westminster. So very proud um, of them. So as, as you said, I'm leader of Camden Council. I've actually just come from a rally that, that we had outside the Camden Council building where there were staff, young people, trade unions, people from some of the businesses um, around, around the council, including the Guardian, coming together to, to say that we want um, to stand by young people. So I think it's young people who've really broken the climate crisis onto a political agenda that was just dominated by um, Brexit and that's a whole other matter, but you know, they were sucking the energy away from this crisis that humanity faced, that our country faced. And young people, um, Greta, but young people in the UK came out and marched, stood up, and now it's getting huge political attention. There are millions of people marching around the globe today, and this is on the political agenda. And I am a politician, so I look forward to you putting um, pressure on me. But, but to, to James, I think if as a politician who, who is denying it, you should, you should stand against them. You're not quite 18 yet, right? But as soon as you get to 18, you should put yourself forward, because we cannot have leaders now who are denying it. 
Um, and we have young people who have a political voice, who have something to say, and you should, you should stand for election and you should mobilise and, and vote for people who are offering an alternative, and you have a huge amount of power um, to do that. So as, um, as Camden, this is, this is incredibly high on, a, on our agenda. For me, it's a, it's a social justice issue as much as a climate issue. The people who are right now seeing the impact of a climate crisis um, are some of the poorest people in the world who are facing flooding, who are becoming climate refugees, who don't have access to water because of the extreme weather um, we're seeing. And the, the biggest polluters um, tend to be in the most affluent countries. And so it is a social justice issue. And we see it within our own communities. Um, with air quality, it's, it's often in the most deprived areas that air quality um, it, or air pollution is highest. In, in this really extremely hot summer we had is vulnerable elderly people in our community who have their health compromised by it. So it's something that, that we have to stand up to as an environmental issue, but, but also a social justice issue. And I think the first thing we need to do is, is make sure that people are aware of, uh, that the crisis is happening. So in all your schools or universities or workplaces, has there been a climate emergency declared? Yeah, yeah put your hand up if you, there has been one. A few. So that's one really simple thing that everyone can do. You can go to your school and you can say, we want to declare a climate emergency. We want to have a group that's looking at what we as an institution are going to do as a school, as a university, to address the climate crisis. And you can get involved in, in changing really simple things. Um, so we have a group called the Sustainers, which are young people at our schools who've been working on how schools address the climate crisis. So some of the ideas that they've had that we're backing with them with is just water fountains so people everyone has a water bottle that they can fill up so they're not having to to use plastic having places to park bikes so they can find different ways to get to school so there's small changes that you can make within your school or your university and um what one of the things that we've done recently as a council is is start the first citizens assembly um in the UK and the citizens assembly is bringing people together from really different backgrounds to discuss an issue and in our Citizens' Assembly, we have people who think we persecute car users. They're like, Camden Council, they persecute car users. And we have people who think we should ban cars tomorrow. And they're really different views in our community. And we brought people together across different ages, different backgrounds, to, to talk about what we could collectively do to address the climate crisis. Because not everyone supports all of the policies that, that we need. And it's really important that everyone recognises that there is a crisis and people come together um, to address it. As a council, we've spent over £150 million on our on our response to the climate crisis. Um, we've got a, a huge policy agenda that, are, that I'll talk to. Um, we, in Camden, we've seen carbon, um, carbon emissions reduced by 38% in large part because of the work we're doing. But the council can't do it on, on our own. We need to work with our communities. And the Citizens' Assembly has been a really powerful way to get communities' ideas. And so there's 18 recommendations that have come forward, and we've committed to take forward all of those recommendations that, um, that go from... Um, supporting community activism in um, streets, um, replacing car parking spaces with green spaces, through to um, solar panels on all of our council estates. So there's a whole range of different things that our citizens have asked us to do, and we have, and we have said that we're going to back. So that, that's been a really powerful um, experience. Um, as a council, we, we have big powers over the built environment. So Camden Council is a developer. We've, we've um, built uh, over 300 council homes. We're building over 1,000. But we can lead the way in, in making those sustainable. So we built the largest ever passive house scheme. That to, took me like a year to learn to say passive house. Um, but it's, um, there, there is a highly sustainable building, which means people are spending so much less on, on heating um, because, because of the way that the building is 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 built now that's more expensive it takes more resource but if we really want to address this all new buildings need to be carbon neutral and that's something that that we're pushing for our own development but also through the powers we have as a planning authority as a council every building that comes up has to get planning permission and we can push developers to um to take the climate crisis seriously 
Now, there are a lot of buildings, a lot of old buildings in London and Camden. And another big issue for us is retrofitting those. So getting um, double glazing onto windows, those kind of changes. And that is a massive um, hole in our, in our budget. So it's something that, that we're really pushing national government to support councils with. Another area we can make a big difference is, is supporting our communities to walk and to cycle um, and to move away from cars. I can't, I can't drive. I failed my driving test five times, which I've rebranded as an environmental choice. Um, <laughs> but people really love their cars, which I've learned. People really do. And um, so there's... There's work we're doing to put in electric charging points um, around the borough to encourage electric car use, but that still has um, an impact on, on um, emissions. So what we're really trying to do is, is encourage alternative transport schemes. So if you wander around Camden, you'll see that there are new um, uh, cycle schemes going in. We spent 35 million on a Tottenham Court Road scheme, which is just around the corner, which is to support active travel, walking um, and cycling. Um, and we, we're across the borough trying to do more to um, green areas, take roads out of um, circulation and, and what one of our roads in the south of the borough we're making into a park. Um, and we've got tra new schemes for around this area which, where the traffic is terrible and anyone who goes to the LSE um, will know dangerous as, as well as encouraging car use. So transport is a massive issue um, and, and I talked about supporting our communities to... To, to change, to, to know information, um, to um, do food recycling, that's a massive push, to, um, take, um, to take smaller journeys by foot, um, to get together. To, we've got a lot of community fo food growing projects and we've got a um, climate crisis fund where community groups can apply to, um, to, to, to get resource, to run local projects. So we have Transition Kedge Town, which is in my ward, which runs all sorts of um, community growing projects, um, eating projects, and, and addressing some of these issues, um, you start to address other issues we face, like the way that people feel isolated and further away from each other. We've got huge issues in Camden um, at the moment around knife violence. We've, we've lost three young people in, in the last five days. And actually, by bringing communities together to start to change the way that we work, the way we travel, the way we live, um, can, be, can be a catalyst for changing some of the other massive um, social issues we face. But it has, to be, it has to be through everything we do. So at the moment, um, I said we reduced by 38%, but we need to get to a zero carbon future. So we are working on a climate budget, which means that we... we put everything, every decision we make, we make through the lens of a climate crisis. And when we um, procure, when we uh, ask of kind of other companies to do things on, on behalf of the council, we, we ask them you know, for certain conditions. So everyone has to be paid the living wage, for example. But we're now asking them for a whole set of sustainability, um, sustainability standards that they have to meet to, to do things for the council. And we have real power to lobby businesses, to lobby other organisations, to follow the lead. And we, what we do, especially around air quality, is get some of the main polluters in the room and work with them about you know, how they change construction methods, how they, um, how they change the way we do things. But I think um, I just finished by saying that you know the most powerful thing for me is is when we have our communities standing up and pushing us to go further because there are real trade offs you know and these aren't easy decisions but what we need is really loud voices standing for office protesting coming to council meetings and and pushing us to go further faster but also pushing national government to really support this agenda. So we have time for a question, so, um, and I'm going to invite anybody in the audience, but particularly welcome uh, a young woman or woman to ask a question first. There's one over there. Yeah. Um, hello, I'm Olivia, and I'm from uh, Bedales um, in Hampshire. And I was just wondering how you would address um, the growing eco-anxiety that is amongst a lot of climate activists at the moment. The growing what? Eco-anxiety, sort of, you know, this very overwhelming um, yeah, situation. Yeah. Um, how would you address that? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I think that that, that feeling of how overwhelming it is, 
has kind of two kind of can go two ways some people that just can't cope with it and they don't want to deal with a problem and actually that's a massive issue is just getting people to understand what's happening or a lot a lot of uh, especially the young people that we work with or the activists is it it you know it's incredibly stressful and i think part of what we're seeing as a society is that there is a kind of we know that the we don't have much time but we're not facing it and you can feel that that um, anxiety and, and, and stress, I think, within our communities. Um, look, I think it's all about local relationships and local action, because, you know, if, we, if you can have a c local community that are doing things together, it can be really small. It can be, you know, um, planting trees, community growing, um, uh, t deciding to carpool trips, small actions that, that build up and feel that you're part of a broader movement. And I think that you know, if you're part of a community where everyone is acting together, you start to feel some of that hope because we have to, you know, if it's if the only messages are terrifying, then we can't, it's, it's, it's too hard for people to engage. So we have to find the action, we have to find the hope, we have to find the places that we, that we come together. So I really, you know, it's a global movement, but I really believe in local relationships and local action. Thank you. Anybody else got a question? Uh, the gentleman in the middle at the back. You want to say your name and where you're from? Uh, hi, I'm Jay Kavaya from Oaks Park. So you emphasised a lot about how this is a social issue within our community. Yeah. But do you think it's also a global social issue? And do you think that developing countries should also do their part? Or do you think that they should receive help for contributing their part? Because they're not able to make as drastic changes as other uh, more developed uh, countries. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think that the, the, so much of the problem has been caused by developed nations and that we do have a responsibility um, to those who are really on the front line of the impact of a climate crisis. But, you know, both um, a, a kind of moral obligation, but also um, an obligation in, in terms of, you know, that we cannot cope with the number of refugees as, that will be caused by... Um, by the the climate crisis so it's something that we absolutely have to act on so i think it's a it's a it's a really good point i think it's it's something that's been our the whole idea of um aid to other countries has been attacked and attacked um but i think that actually it's a, it's fundamentally a justice issue it's not about charity it, it, it's about justice and there are real injustices and as other countries are saying well we want to grow we want to provide jobs and opportunities um there needs to be support for those to be sustainable jobs and sustainable opportunities um so uh, it, that's why it's so depressing and i think your question was so good to see america step away from those global obligations as a massive polluter themselves and i think that anything you know we stand with anyone the citizens in the usa who are protesting and pushing but we should do our bit to push our own government um and within europe to to um to to meet those social justice obligations thank you very much georgia thank you and um we now i'm going to invite ann jones who is the um Vice Chair of the National Federation of Women's Institutes is going to tell us about what the Women's Institutes should be doing to stop climate change. Anne. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to start by telling us which secondary school you went to? Yes, I think my voice gives it away, really. Um, I'm Welsh, <laughs> uh, so obviously I went to school in Wales, uh, and I went to Gwendraith Grammar School, and it's probably one of the last grammar schools that existed at that time. Uh, it's lovely to see some grammar schools coming back. Um, a fantastic place for right. academia, uh, but for me, it was more about sport because uh, Gwendraith had this reputation of uh, producing the best Welsh rugby players you could ever dream of. <laughs> so, yeah, as a young girl, yeah. that really hit the spot <laughs> for me. <laughs> no, it was a good school. It was yeah. a good school. Um, I've been introduced as being the chairman of, uh, vice chairman of uh, NFWI, the National Organization of Women's Institute. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have no idea what the WI is all about. Uh, but it is the largest women's organization in the UK. Um, and in England and Wales and the islands, we have about 220,000 members. Having said that, I think that each and every one of you, if you're 18, 
should be a member and if you're female. And for you lads, if you want to join us, all you have to do is live as a woman. <laughs> uh, on the screen, you can see a picture of over 200 of my members uh, on the 26th of June when we gathered in London for the Climate Day, uh, the Time Is Now lobby, to talk to our MPs and to press the urgency of the situation on them and to challenge them on how they would react to the climate crisis. Um, you can also see that they're holding a five metre long climate scarf. Uh, now, th this was knitted by our members. Now, that won't surprise many of you. Craft and cookery, jam and Jerusalem is what WI is well known for. Uh, but this is a way that those members who aren't usually politically motivated can get involved and actually show that they care about the climate as well. So the scarf is made up of the graph, uh, the Ed Hawkins uh, graph, which shows the uh, increase in temperature over the last 100 years. So we stand in solidarity with all of you young people here today and all over the world. I'm proud to say that although I'm here in London, within my own seaside town in Aberystwyth, there is also a gathering. Children are on strike and also adults are joining in to support the whole movement and the raising of awareness of how urgent climate change is. Uh, we have a strong personal sense of urgency uh, within the WI and we've been taking action for a number of years to help the environment uh, in our own homes and in our own communities. So I'll be talking with you um, about WI members, what they've achieved uh, historically with our campaigns and how WI members are change makers in their communities um, and excitingly our amazing network of climate ambassadors. Idyllic view, isn't it? This is the view from my kitchen window. <laughs> and this is the view that I would like to preserve as well. My family life is centred around our farm in the foothills of the Cumbrian Mountains in Llandewi Brevi. I'm sure for some of you, more uh, notorious because of Little Britain. Yeah, the only gay in the village. <laughs> but I'm a sheep farmer, um, and like thousands of others across the country, we've been struck by the extremes that the British climate has thrown at us recently. Just a, a year and a half ago, we had the beast of the, from the east, a cold snap during lambing, which was heartbreaking for us as farmers, seeing uh, the lambs and the ewes suffer so much in that really awful, awful time. Then that was followed by the drought, which turned our wonderful green fields and hills into a red barren land. So farmers have suddenly woken up and smelt the roses. They can see that this is an issue as well. You know, one of you said earlier about the denial. I think there's far less denial than there was. Just the extreme weathers within the UK has made us all realize it is now. So the extreme weather patterns have become more and more likely as a result of climate change. It's a fact. It's not something I'm making up. Now, I'm proud of our long history of campaigning within the WI. Uh, it dates all the way back to 1927, when we passed a resolution calling for international action on oil pollution from ships. There's still pollution from ships. Tackling waste and pollution is something WI members feel very passionately about. Um, and one of our most famous initiatives stems from a resolution calling for a campaign to preserve the countryside against desecration by litter. This resolution passed in 1954 led to the formation of Keep Britain Tidy campaign, something that a lot of people don't associate the WI with. But more recently, in 26, WI members took their concerns about excess packaging to supermarkets. And this was something where we got members mobile. You know, there's nothing like mobility of members, young people, to actually see change. Uh, and handing back all that excess packaging to supermarkets made them think more about their packaging. I think it's time, probably, that we did it again. In 2009, members got involved in what was probably one of our most successful and passionate campaign, which was around the honeybees. 
and poll pollinators in general. And we joined up with Friends of the Earth and had a really successful campaign, and we persuaded the government to introduce a bee action plan. Now, climate change has been on the WI agenda for many years, and we've worked with other organisations to support the passing of the pioneering Climate Change Act in 2008. As you can see on the slide, members remain concerned about this issue. Our centenary research identified that members were most concerned about the impact of climate change on future generations, loss of wildlife and increased flooding. Women are on the forefront of the impacts of climate change around the world, but also have an important role to play in acting as change agents in their own communities. I now talk you through some of the ways that the WI continues to work on this issue and how they're engaging within their communities. I said earlier about our exciting climate ambassadors, but three years ago we decided to recruit these climate ambassadors, members who felt passionately about the issue of climate change and wanted to campaign locally within their communities. Climate ambassadors are invaluable to the organisation. They are the grassroots of the WI and have a big impact in shaping government policy, putting pressure on their MPs and in Wales Assembly members and engaging their local community on climate change. So in 2017, a climate ambassador from Cheshire, Sue, she met with her then climate minister, Nick Hurd. Sue told the minister about persuading seven other people in her neighbourhood to switch to electric vehicles. He was so impressed with Sue that when the government published its clean growth strategy, her story was featured as a positive case study. Sue is now planning to go on a Cheshire climate roadshow and is offering to talk at WI group meetings during the 2020-21 to discuss the impacts of climate change and what they as individuals can do to help. Jill, a climate ambassador in Essex, first met her MP Sir Bernard Jenkin back in 2015. Since that first meeting, they have continued to meet regularly and he has now chaired four annual public meetings on climate change in the constituency. Now, I'm sure Bernard would be the first to admit that he wasn't on board at the beginning. <laughs> but since that time, he has written to government ministers to pass on the concerns that emerged from those meetings. He's written an op-ed with the Labour MP Alex Sobel about the importance of wanting a green future for our children and joined the Conservative Environment Network. We can make a difference when we talk to our MPs. Another climate ambassador from Worcestershire walked 150 miles from Malvern to the NFWI's annual meeting in Liverpool, this to raise awareness about climate change and challenge each one of the members present to think about what they could do in their home and in their WIs. We now have nearly 200 registered climate ambassadors and we continue to recruit new ambassadors to the scheme. Now, in February and March of this year, climate ambassadors received training by climate, climate Outreach with the Grantham Institute. And I think Bobby were there to witness some of the really successful days that we had. Uh, it was all to, to help them tackle uh, the fear of challenging their MPs, of giving them the information on what they could pass on to their MPs, giving them resources so that they felt empowered to speak up. It was a really exciting and positive training day, uh, probably one of the better ones that we've had over the years. So they were, activities were designed to ensure climate change felt relevant, so that it was now, immediate, and that something could be done locally. And once they had built the connection, provide them with actions that they can take that will make the impacts of climate change seem less overwhelming. Because on the face of it, it is a huge subject. For example, as you can see on the screen, climate ambassadors are holding climate impact events to educate people on the impact of flooding, drought and heat waves, and practical things they can do, such as helping vulnerable people during a heat wave in their area and helping wildlife to cope with drought. Now, bear with me. I feel very passionate. 
absolutely about climate change, I've got four daughters, and I worry about what the world will be like for their children if we don't do something today. We need to do something now, the time is now, we have to make a difference. It's about all our futures. It's about my future, my children's future, my grandchildren's future. The Earth is sending out alarm signals to all of us. Now I hope that that's uh, just shown you the passion <laughs> that's behind. Stop it quick. <laughs> well, let's go and have that one. Let's go out of that, shall we? <laughs> we definitely do not want Brexit today. <laughs> we can only tackle one major issue at the time. And that's certainly not Brexit. <laughs> I don't think even our politicians can tackle that, can they? Uh, that short clip was just to show you that our members feel passionately about this. We're with you as young people, and we want you to see the support that you have from the older generation to make sure that your voices are heard. You know, just join us in all of this. Uh, Gillian Madge, one of the members from Totnes WI in Cornwall, emphasised it's all about all of our future. It's about my future, my children's future, my grandchildren's future. The earth is sending out alarm signals to all of us. So we as women across the world have a key role in tackling climate change as consumers, educators and change agents in our homes and our communities, encouraging the adoption of lower carbon lifestyles and passing on green values to the next generation. I'm not just saying this, I strongly believe in it. Uh, within our own farm at home, one of the things that we have done is installed a microhydro power system. Uh, that's from a waterfall that we have on the land. So it's using a natural resource to actually solve the crisis within our small village. It just produces enough for that tiny little village. But every little bit helps. So I believe that together we can make a difference. And as one of our climate ambassadors pointed out in the training, think of a mosquito in a bedroom. It doesn't matter that you are small, you can still make an impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. So we have time for some questions. So uh, hands up if you want to ask a question, and in particular, young women. Lady at the front here. Lady at the front here, yes, please. Just right in the front row here in the middle. you'd like to say who you are and where you're from? Hi, my name is Anjali and I come from UCL Academy. Um, I wanted to ask how come there isn't a group for, uh, for boys? I mean, it's great that you know, you're having women getting involved, but as it's, this, as it's a global thing, shouldn't there be also a boys group? Uh, yeah, I have seen no problem in boys setting up their own uh, organizations. And there, there are organizations like uh, the Men's Sheds, uh, the Rotary Groups, you know, there are lots of organisations out there for men. Uh, organisations involved with their works, like uh, the Farmers' Union or any other organisation with their employment. But uh, we have to remember that the WI was set up 104 years ago, at a time when the voice of women was non-existent. You know, I love the policy of LSE that there's equality in that a man and a woman will ask a question. Um, so. The WI has come a long way in making sure that that voice is equal, and I applaud organisations like the LSE for doing it. But there's a room for a, a men's organisation, and I challenge you in the room today, go on, start one. <laughs> okay, boys, you know uh, she set out the challenge, but we won't get into that now. Anybody else want to ask a question, male or female? At the back there, on left... Yep. Say who you are and where you're from. My name's Ben. I work for a charity called Climate Ed, which delivers workshops in schools about climate change. Um, I've got a question for the panel, but also to any of the young people in the audience, and that's about people's feelings about flying, because for most individuals, um, flying constitutes the biggest fraction of our individual carbon footprint. Um, and, you know, we... Until recently, people just felt flying was just a natural thing. You know, the world was our oyster. We could just fly wherever we wanted, whenever we wanted. Um, do, do young people have a different 
outlook now and do do they feel that you know cl flying is morally dubious and the world isn't simply just available to visit whenever we want very good and do you want to have first yeah i'll have first pass at it um yeah we are part of the the world yeah the, we are a global uh, organization uh, the wi is part of acww associated country women of the world um, and to just put a ban on flying full stop would isolate Britain from the rest of the world. But I think whenever any of us have to take a flight, be it for work or for leisure, then we have to think seriously about if there is any other method that we could use that is less uh, destroying of the planet. So I would say reduce by all means, uh, cut it out completely if you can, but I can't see uh, that we can un- get rid of aeroplanes altogether. Um, but hopefully we will have technology and science on our side, which will make them less environmentally damaging, which is probably the future. Georgia or Nick, would you like to? It, three things, really. One is that people should pay for the carbon that they use, and we should have a proper carbon tax, which would affect the price of uh, air transport the, and reduce the amount. The, the, the second is to run it much more efficiently um, and you know run full aeroplanes, make sure that air traffic control systems work so you don't waste. But basically the answer is um, uh, the one you just got which is that you have to find different ways of um, fueling them, of keeping them in, in the air. And there can be uh, biokerosene, there can be synthetic uh, kerosene, there can be kerosene from algae, um, uh, short distance flights, will, some of them will be electric. But this is an area where we really have to push very hard to find ways of uh, doing, things, doing things differently. There's a good publication called Mission Possible, which came out um, about uh, 11, 10, 11 months ago, which describes in the very difficult areas what you can uh, actually do. But I think get, getting aggressive and slagging people off doesn't help. And this is a case where we have to be constructive, find different ways of doing things. And that's the way I think we should uh, approach this one. Very good. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes the first half. So give our speakers another round of applause, please. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to invite our speakers to take a seat, and I'm going to ask our panelists to come and join me on stage seamlessly. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, let me very briefly um, introduce our excellent panel. On my immediate right is Victoria Hans, who uh, used to be here at LSE, but is now uh, uh, a representative of an organization called the EAUC, which is the Alliance for Sustainability Leadership in Education. Uh, then we have on... Uh, Victoria's right, we have Naomi Oreskes, who's the professor of the history of science at Harvard University. Uh, and then we're very lucky on Naomi's right, we have two members of the UK Student Climate Network from Seven Oaks School who've traveled all the way from their strike in Kent to get here today. Uh, we have first, uh, it's Ellie, is it? Uh, and then uh, Ellie Gilbert Bear and Gabby Tan. So what I'm going to do is start by asking them each a question. They'll start by telling us which school they're from. Obviously, Ellie and Gabby have already revealed. Um, and then we're going to throw it open to the audience for questions. So get ready. So I'm going to start with um, Ellie, actually. Uh, what do you think schools should do to stop climate change? 
Um, I think that there are two fights that schools really should be fighting, and one is the fight against climate change, and two is the fight for climate justice. So in terms of fighting climate change, I know that EcoSchools provides a really, really great framework for schools to create concrete change within their institutions. Um, it's designed to be a student-led initiative, so it starts with creating an eco-committee of people from all years in their school. So ways um, schools can help start this is just by reaching out to students and making sure students feel encouraged to pursue initiatives that they're really passionate about. Um, another thing I think they can do is about education and accessibility. So things as simple as creating posters to show students what they can recycle, what they can't, um, small things they can do in their life so that people can easily see changes they can make. But also getting in the fight um, for proper classroom education. So the national curriculum does not actually require comprehensive climate education in the UK. Um, and the only way it would be in the national curriculum is if you choose to take geography at GCC level, which many people don't. And so if schools can get involved in that fight to work with um, educators and other institutions to get that into the curriculum, that w this way more schools who don't have, let's say, the same amount of knowledge about the climate can then um, have resources to really teach their students about this. And in terms of climate justice, I think that really schools should be supporting school strikers. So what is climate justice? It is making a fair and just transition into a green future. And Regarding this, we understand that not all schools have the resources to you know, make drastic changes to their schools because it requires a lot of time and a lot of money. And so by encouraging their students to strike, whether that be just not punishing them, making it more accessible, or by actually helping them strike, um, they could be a part of a bigger movement in which they you know, are creating big change at a government level because if you look at who's producing these fossil fuels. You see that 100 companies worldwide produce 71% of global emissions, which shows that there's a clear systemic issue here. And so by encouraging students to take part, they can tackle this issue. Um, by things as simple as even just helping them catch up with work they're missing. Because most students don't want to miss school, they think it's the only way they can be heard. And so just by helping them stay on top of schoolwork and make a change, they can really help the fight for climate justice. Thank you very much, Ellie. And do, what about school setting targets for getting to net zero? Um, has Seven, Seven Oaks set a target, or what do you think of that as um, an idea? Seven Oaks is relatively new in terms of setting up eco committees and working towards sustainability. I think that if it's possible for student, or schools, it would be amazing if they could set these kind of targets and if they could also work with local councils on this. I know that schools who are more international or, I guess, better funded, who take some school trips, one option for them is to look into carbon offsets yep. to, you know, so that they're not polluting things in terms of flying or even riding the train. Um, and so I definitely agree that if they have the resources, that's a very um, positive thing to do. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ellie. So, Gabby, um, what do you think students should be doing to stop climate change? Okay, so first of all, um, I'm going to start by saying I think it's actually kind of sad that it's come down to the need for like students to help tackle the climate crisis because of the prolonged inaction of those in power. So quite frankly, I think we've been failed by, the, by our system that drives destruction. And while we should ideally be focusing on enjoying and making the most of our childhood years, um, our future looks frighteningly uncertain, and many of us spend hours like organizing at meetings and campaigning because we're desperate to be heard. Um, but then again, I think every revolution needs a symbol. And so at the same time, I'm kind of glad that this is our movement, because I think the youth have especially powerful voices as we've grown up in a world plagued by the consequences of climate change. And we'll see the change that we need, because we are very much a force to be reckoned with. Um, so I think um, one thing students can do is join the Strike for Climate movement in their local areas. So. Um, as said before, Ellie and I just came straight from the Seven Oaks base strike, where we made specific demands um, for our local councils, including declaring a climate emergency and making climate action a priority, as well as forming a binding citizens' assembly um, that will incorporate all points of view and um, people of all backgrounds in the conversations about the climate crisis. Um, because most of us are not able to vote right now, and we've tried other things like letter writing and petitioning to no avail, um, I think striking is our best way to be heard right now. And I guess because it's a lot harder for the governments to ignore the problem when we sacrifice our education 
take our fight to the streets um, and bring out the largest climate mobilization in history as we are doing today. So even if striking is not an option for you, your voice is as important as ever, and we still need you to act in solidarity by helping us spread our demands um, as far and wide as possible, whether that's through social media or calling your local reps. So tomorrow I'll be joining 400 other young climate leaders at the first ever Youth Climate Summit to engage with global leaders about climate solutions. So hopefully we'll be able to convince them to commit to bolder actions and um, a pivotal moment in our progress to its a viable future will be made. Um, however, it can't just stop at striking, so I think persistence is really key and students should also learn about the ways climate change is and will impact their own communities, as well as the countries who are facing the brunt of climate change, yet contributing very little to the problem. So, um, and knowing exactly what you're fighting for and fighting against um, will only make our movement stronger. So keep engaging with your local politicians and never ever let them forget how important a viable, safe, and just future is to us all. So, and while collective action and drastic systemic change is ultimately what we need, um, I think making lifestyle changes that are accessible to you and convincing others around you to do the same is also important and shouldn't be overlooked. Um, from like cutting your meat intake to decarbonizing your commute to work or um, consuming as well as urging your parents who can vote um, to vote wisely, then I think we are empowered as the largest generation um, to pressure governments and businesses into changing before laws and agreements force them to and, is in, and, in, and it is indeed too late. So finally, I think it is also really easy for us to read the news and feel super overwhelmed by the horrors of the climate crisis. But I think it's also important for us as students to try our best not to be consumed or get lost um, in worrying about what we may not necessarily be able to control um, and instead focus on the great things being done and the great things we can do. So for example, the ways we can come together, the noise we will make, the, and the future we will create as a really powerful movement. So all in all, I think students should speak up and add their voices to the youth climate movement um, whenever they can um, and continue to pressure their local and national governments into acting. Uh, learn about the, the reality of the crisis and just uh, never ever give up because we can and will secure the future we deserve, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gabby. Thank you very much indeed, Gabby. So I'm going to turn to Victoria next and uh, ask her, um, first of all, to tell us what school she went to, secondary school, and then to answer the question, what should universities do to stop climate change? Thanks, Bob. So I went to a secondary comprehensive uh, in Surrey, which has now merged with three other local schools. Um, and I actually was privileged enough <coughs> to um, read my doctorate here at the London School of Economics. So I really encourage any young people here to um, apply. The LSE um, has, <laughs> has really uh, inspired and empowered me. Um, so I've been lucky enough, though, to found the first sustainability uh, unit here at the LSE, looking at um, the campus, so not the academic side of things, but the campus. And it's really important, the practical um, elements of sustainability. And I'm here today representing the umbrella body for universities um, in the UK and uh, further education colleges in the UK. And we're part of a global network. So universities across the world have sustainability managers and teams. Uh, and we work really closely with students. And the LSE team was started because students lobbied uh, the director at the LSE. So you're really <coughs> powerful. And um, there are energy managers, there are um, biodiversity managers. So there's lots of roles and ways to contribute. So what should universities do now? So if you're at a university or thinking to go to a university, um, these are the sorts of things you can be thinking about. And we're really interested in if you're thinking of going to a university, contact them and ask them what their stand is, what their approach is, because they're interested in your fees. So, you know, you need to make sure, a bit like Nick was saying about, you know, working for institutions that are ethical, you need to make sure your educational establishments are ethical. Um, so, the 
There is a global climate letter which we're asking all educational establishments, so all post-16 establishments, to sign. And that, that's, we've seen this um, throughout, but really that's asking for a commitment, that's asking for policies which resu will result in action. So it's sort of a three-stage process, and you'll be familiar with that already. So the glo global climate letter means that we can come together, unite together, and show global pressure. So it's open to universities, colleges, post-16 institutions across the world. So we really want to invite. So if you know people overseas, invite them to sign the letter or their institutions to sign the Global Climate Letter as well. Um, in terms of policy and commitments, it's net zero carbon you know, a target for net zero carbon. Um, by 2030, 2050, the sooner we do this, the better. And you'll understand that all government policies go through a consensus building process. So the more radical you can be or demand your institutions to be, you know, let's not wait. <laughs> let's, let's front load this. Let's start enjoying the innovation and, and pulling people into that. And obviously the action... So there's immediate action, as, as has been pointed out, personal actions you can take, and then how you can influence your family, your friends, your streets, your neighbourhood, your schools. Um, and sometimes that needs money behind it, and there are ways of linking with your local authorities. They have ways of raising revenue. Um, and in universities and in your studies, start researching the elements where people are uncertain. Find out what universities find difficult, or your college, or your school, and then do a research project on that. Engage with your academics, your teachers, and ask them to contribute. There's so many specialisms, and there's such a vast array of knowledge within your institutions. So start using that and encourage. So. Um, universities across the UK in the curriculum we're asking chemists to say well how can you contribute mathematicians physicists you know um, artists so it doesn't matter what your specialism is or what you're interested in that can all be brought to bear to contribute so some of the projects uh, um, if I just uh, name them but the workplace parking levy is a way for local authorities to encourage to put a charge on car park spaces but but that generates a revenue and Nottingham has done this and generated millions of pounds over the last five years which is to inf invest then in sustainable transport and infrastructure and active travel. Um, zero carbon homes, we heard Georgia earlier talk about you know, the, what's happening in Camden. So there's lots of ways, that you, so even if your institution can't access funds, you can link with and support other institutions to access funds. And funding is often what you'll find is the first, sorry we can't do that, but there are innovative ways you can get around that. Um, so, so that's sort of the global climate letter and some of the actions. Um, and you've mentioned, I'm really pleased to have heard mentioned several times, but citizen assemblies, you know, this must be the way forward. This is about everybody having an equal voice and a shared commitment. So experiment with that and perhaps have a think, you know, we might not be all as skilled in collaboration. So it's a learning experience. And the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which is an act in Wales, which applies to, to Wales, three million inhabitants there, has five ways of working, which we all need to start engaging with. So thinking in the long term, we have the science, but you know, when we make a purchase, are we thinking about weeks or months or years? You know, how many times do we wear our clothes? So thinking long term, um, involving the diversity of interests, collaborating Integrating, integrating all the knowledge across different areas and, and really ensuring that we're preventing problems so we stop doing things which are causing problems. So you can find out more about those five ways of working but you might be able to do a research project on those or hook into those but remember we are all learning. We might not get things right the first time but it's not about polarising the goodies and the baddies. It's about collaborating together and being interested and learning together. And then we also, as part of that sort of citizens' assembly, linking staff and students, local authorities, public sector bodies, private sector corporates together, um, it's really focusing on innovation because 
whilst the threat is grave and severe and we must take ur urgent action, um, I personally don't get inspired. I get quite upset by that. So let's focus on the innovation which is re required that we can all bring our unique gifts and skills together to innovate, to leave a positive legacy. So um, we really um, want to mobilise your personal resources, your political resources, your institutional resources and unite together. So currently that Global Climate Letter has 144 institutions signed up representing 2.5 million students and 43 international networks representing over 8,000 institutions. They might be your institution, so let's talk about that and let's communicate about that. So if you get an opportunity, you know, share the information, that's something else um, that you can be doing. So we've heard a lot today, you know, lots of stimulating things, but your voice is important. Now, you might not ever know the results of the letters you write or the questions you ask, but it doesn't have to have your name on it. So if I can just encourage you, you have no idea um, what a conversation on the train or the tube might bring to somebody else's um, you know, world or influence. So we would just encourage you to keep this topic live um, as often as you can. Um, so the, the alliance, the EAUC, ha is putting together a climate emergency framework which we'll be sharing with universities, colleges and post-16 establishments across the country. And we would love your input into that. Um, We've, we've heard, you know, a lot about solid, solidarity and uniting together, but, you know, I'm so in admiration of the youth who are going on strike, and we really want to... We've been working for decades in the sector, um, sort of pushing water up a hill is sometimes that how it feels. So, so many people in the sector are so excited at this new wave of energy and we really want to provide all the resources to you. If your institution is a member, every student in the institution has access to those and can shape those resources. So please find out more about the EAUC, the Environmental Association of Universities and Colleges, and approach your lecturers and academics because they're so willing and so inspirational to support you. Thank you very much, Victoria. And I'm happy to say that um, Manish Shafiq, the director of LSE, last night announced that LSE has set itself a target of getting to net zero emissions by 2050. Now, um, that means all our emissions. We already have 100% green energy, but it also means we will have to get rid of all the emissions embodied in everything we do uh, right across the campus, including transport to and from work. So it's a, um, a first step. I think we hope we can do it before 2050, but I hope other, there are other universities who've set that target, and I hope we will see more universities and indeed schools start to set those targets. So um, I'm going to now ask Naomi, finally, to uh, um, ask the question, what should climate researchers and university staff more broadly do to stop climate change? Ah, well, that wasn't the question I wanted. <laughs> because I think, you know, climate researchers, in, in a sense, have done their job. The scientists have sorted out this problem. Fifty years ago, there were major uncertainties about how much carbon dioxide would be absorbed in the ocean or how much carbon dioxide would be taken up by the biosphere or what impact some of the other greenhouse gases, like methane, had on the atmosphere. But all of those questions have essentially been answered which isn't to say that scientists should necessarily retire or go into jurisprudence, but I really think that the, the central, the action now is not really in the science so much. I sometimes think about climate change as being a relay race, and it's time for the scientists, the natural scientists, to pass the baton. This is really now a social, economic, and political issue. So I think we need to highlight much more those dimensions of the debate, the questions of investment that Nick was just talking about a few minutes ago, uh, and I think, and the questions of political action. How do we make social change? How do we mobilize this amazing groundswell of energy that we see from people, but yet there's a giant disconnect between what people want 
here in the United Kingdom, here in the United States, all across the world, and what our political leaders are doing, what our business leaders are doing. How do we mobilize the business community? So I think those kinds of questions, particularly at a place like LSE, which is connected to the business community, where people here think hard about investments, I think those are the kinds of questions that need to be highlighted. And then there is the issue of investment and divestment. So I've been involved at Harvard. We have a, a piece today in the Harvard Gazette. Um, many universities are deeply and profoundly hypocritical on this issue. At Harvard, we say we understand the climate threat. We say we're committed to doing something about it. And yet we continue to invest in the fossil fuel companies, including coal, that are driving climate change. And something that many people don't understand about natural resource development and exploitation, I used to be an exploration geologist. I worked on mining projects. Um, it takes a very long time from the day you begin an exploration project to when you actually pull minerals out of the ground or oil, gas, or coal. In some cases, it can be as long as 30 years. The project that I worked on when I was a young geologist uh, they had begun exploration in the early 1970s. We didn't actually pull stuff out of the ground for about 20 years. So that means that anyone who is continuing to explore for new oil, gas, and coal reserves today is committing to be using those reserves 10, 20, 30 years from now. And yet we know that is exactly what we cannot do. So how can anyone Anyone who cares, cares to understand this issue, claims to understand the issue, or cares about it, how could anyone be still investing in fossil fuel exploration development? And yet many of our universities are. And I think that has to stop. So just yesterday we got the great news that the University of California is divesting its pension from fund, and this is enormous. It's a huge amount of money. Uh, it will send a strong signal to investors around the United States. And I think we need to see all universities do this. And when one of you was talking earlier about what you folks can do as young people, I had two thoughts. Um, what would it look like? At Harvard, we boast about how you know, we think we're the greatest university in the world. And we boast about how um, our acceptance rate, what we call the yield, is sky high. When students are in, admitted to Harvard, they almost always come, with rare exceptions. But what if students started turning down Harvard and saying, you know what? I'm going to go to the University of California, Berkeley, or I'm going to go to Stanford, where at least they've divested from coal, even if not well, I guess. I'm not going to go to Harvard until Harvard changes its investment policies. The faculty have been talking to the Harvard administration about this for a decade now, and the administration pays no attention to us. But if students stopped coming, I think you would see a change in the administration policies overnight. The other thing I wanted to say about young people is, you have a lot of potential to change the world by influencing your parents. I was thinking when you were speaking a few minutes ago about how when I was at your age, there was a very famous song by Crosby, Stills, and Nash called Teach Your Children Well. And the final refrain of it is to the children saying, teach your parents well, right? Parents learn from their children. And there's some point in your life, and there's an inflection point, and I know this because I've experienced it, where you suddenly realize you're learning more from your children then you're teaching them. And that's kind of a beautiful moment in a person's life, because at least for me, I feel like, oh, I can relax. <laughs> so you can be very powerful. And I'll just tell one story, one concrete example of that. So in the United States, people who are involved in this issue are always looking to collaborate, to reach across the aisle, to collaborate with others, to build coalitions. But it's very, very hard to do this in the United States right now, because the Republican Party has been entrenched in a position of climate change denial for so long that you know, when people are really dug in on an issue, it's difficult for them to uh, find a way out and save face. But one of the leaders in this area in America is the con former Congressman Bob Inglis, who was a climate change denier. He comes from South Carolina. He often says that he represented the most conservative, the reddest district in the reddest state of America. But he realized that climate change was real and a threat. And he stepped up to the plate and became a leader. He lost his seat in Congress, but he's now far more famous than he was when he was in Congress. Um, because in Congress, he was just one of 574 people. Now he's this unique political leader, a Republican who publicly speaks about climate change. So um, when I first met him, I asked him, and it was a panel like this. I said, Bob, so 
what made you change your mind on this issue? And here's the story he told. His son went to Duke University where he took a class in environmental studies. And his son came home for the Thanksgiving holidays, or I think it was Thanksgiving, might have been Christmas, and over the dinner table looked at his father and said, Dad, you're wrong on this issue, and if you don't change your mind, I will not vote for you in the next election. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, Naomi. Okay, um, now, I have chaired this not very well today. Uh, we are now approaching four o'clock, which was the official end time. Anybody who d definitely needs to leave now, please do so, but I'm going to suggest we have just five minutes to have a few Q and A. So anybody who needs to leave, please leave, otherwise we're gonna have another five minutes. And what I'm gonna do is take three questions together and then ask the panel to answer it. So, hands up if you have a question. Uh, this uh, young woman here in the white T-shirt, please, first. Hi, is this on? Yep. Know. Okay. Um, my name's Emily. I'm from Seattle, Washington. I'm an incoming graduate student in the MSc in Environmental Economics and Climate Change here Very this good. year. Um, my question is about, so in America, I mean, we touched on Donald Trump, obviously, earlier, but like most people that I've been surrounded by are kind of in this area of, um, you know, they know climate change exists, but it's not really front of mind. It's kind of scary to think about. And like from an economic perspective, the burden placed on individuals to change, like the incentives to change aren't really there yet from a behavior perspective. Um, and so I'm just curious, I guess this question is kind of directed at Victoria, but obviously anybody can answer is when we're having, like people in this room obviously understand the issue very well, um, but like when we're having conversations with our peers that maybe are in, you know, what I described, how do you approach that without making people feel like ostracized and, um, I don't know, totally out of it. Okay, so good. Uh, another question uh, down here in the middle. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, Sue Holmes. I'm from Australia. I used to be an economist working for the Australian government. I'm now an activist working with GetUp. <laughs> um, my question is, um, sometimes governments don't listen, and clearly, especially in Australia, they're not um, on climate change. And some issues, suffragettes, uh, Gandhi, civil rights, Arguing well, even turning out massive numbers, was not enough. It ended up being non-violent, disruptive demonstrations. And I guess Extinction Rebellion is the face of that today. So my question would be, um, can we just go on being reasonable and do we have to be more disruptive? Very good. And one final question. Anybody got a question they want to ask? Let's have a man for a change here. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm from the Czech Republic, but I study here at University College London. And my question would be leading towards like the change in behavior of people or perception of changes in the environmental policies. For example, in Czech Republic, I see that many companies are trying to make a change. And there are like marketing loads about, the, about and talking about the, all the difference since they, they are doing in, the, in their firms. But I see that the public perceives it as just like a false marketing that they don't think that the intentions of the companies are actually the good intentions. They just think that they want more, more marketing and, and, and being seen as good, but they don't think that they actually are good. How would you approach this change in behavior of, of people so that they can perceive it, the good actions as actually good actions, not just marketing? Very good. Okay. So we have three questions there. One is that how to have conversations with uh, people who don't already get it in a way that's constructive. Um, we get to get change. Should we carry on being reasonable or do we need to do, go beyond that? And finally, what should companies do to convince people that it's not just greenwash if they're acting on climate change? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to invite each one of the panelists in turn to answer any of the questions succinctly, not but not, <laughs> not all of them, preferably. So um, let's start with Victoria, then Naomi, Ellie, and then Gabby gets the final word. So um, I think for the, for if you get it, 
um, then it's great to be supported by people or be around people who get it. I've often been the only person in a room who gets it and it feels quite isolating. So I think we need to acknowledge that you need to have buddies and people you can speak to who inspire you, the literature, you know, but you don't necessarily have to share that with people who don't get it. You need to find what, be interested in them and find out what they're interested in. So in my experience, most people love the same things. We love our people, other people, our families, and we love our leisure time, usually in nature. So there's always a link in, and then you can build from there. So I think it's being interested in the other. And for me, this is, I, um, you know, this is about collaboration. So it's like a circle. So there's all the degrees around the circle and everybody having equal voice. So I think it's about living those values. Um, and I often get inspired by indigenous communities and indigenous peoples and hearing, you know, people really staying true to their voice, even though their communities are flattened, uh, destructive. And I had the, I was really lucky to meet some uh, chiefs from uh, America, from the what is now Richmond, Virginia. And those chiefs now have been granted recognition as of their chief status. So they should really be treated like royalty, like the British royalty. But they, don't, they didn't require any of that. And I, I asked them how could they be so, well, forgiving, really. And they said they're just not interested in the past. They're interested in the well-being of all peoples and all, you know, nature. They're well, the well-being of our planet. So, you know, that sustains me to have conversations with people who don't get it. And I think that's really important. The Climate Psychology Alliance, this sort of touches on the other questions, is really taking off here in the UK. So that's where psychologists have noticed that that youth anxiety, or youth in particular, in particular, but anxiety around these big issues which don't feel that's the system we can't change. Um, it's acknowledging that. So I think the, the Climate Psychology Alliance, the CPA, is a good website to look at for quite radical writing that really makes you feel that you're, you know, <laughs> you've got it. Um, and then I think Nick uh, has always inspired me with this, but it's about positive futures. You know, this is a really exciting time. We don't want fossil fuel uh, driving our economy anymore, but what could be possible instead? So this is about capturing your ideas and new technologies. So innovation, and I think lots of people can engage on that. What would you like the future to look, at, look like? And how would you like it to feel for you, for your families? So hopefully that sort of touches on, on that. Thank you very much, Victoria. Naomi. Yeah, I'd like to build on the comment about shared values and also say something about being reasonable. Um, so I think this idea of finding common values, especially for many people in leisure, recreation, outdoor life, is hugely important. I'm on the board of a nonprofit, which is a little bit of a different kind of environmental group. It's called Protect Our Winters. And we organized to mobilize the outdoor sports community, particularly the ski and snowboard industry and athletes from these um, sports to become ambassadors on climate change, a bit like the women's institutes. These young people, because the athletes are all young, have been incredibly powerful. Students love them. They're celebrities. You know, we send them to schools and the kids are just gaga. You know, someone who's won an Olympic medal or someone who has skied down Mount Everest. These people are amazing. And many of them were not at all politically active before. Our demographic is, is very young, much younger than most environmental groups. And we come together over this shared passion, and our motto is turning passion into purpose. And we have found we have meet, reached many people who had not previously been engaged in this issue by tapping into that shared value of love of nature, love of the outdoors, um, and just the sheer fun, the beauty of skiing or snowboarding or just being out in the woods. And we've now mobilized trail runners as well. We've got rock climbers, mountaineers. And this has been a very powerful message. So if you're interested in outdoor sports, you should join us, Protect Our Winters. It's only $5 to join. Um, or think about other organizations like that, like the Women's Institute, that might not be traditionally thought of as an environmental group, but yet in which people have shared values where they can work together and be powerful. And just one other thing about that, you guys gave me an idea for something we might do together. So I know one obstacle that many schools have to reducing their emissions is that there's no funding 
particularly if you're a government school, to say put up solar panels. Um, in my organization, one of the problems we have is that our athletes travel like crazy, and they have to travel for their sports. They cannot do their sport. They cannot compete on the World Cup if they don't travel. So we've had this big discussion about offsets and the whole problem of verification of offsets. But what if we formed a partnership where our athletes help to pay for solar panels on your schools? And wouldn't that be fun if we could advertise it? And maybe you could even like Skype in with some of our athletes. So think about it and maybe we could, maybe we could follow up. I think that could be like a really great win-win because -win, um, our athletes are very worried about this issue. Uh, just quickly on the reasonableness issue, I don't want to be quoted in public as saying that I want you or anyone else to be unreasonable. But what I will say is I want you to be unrealistic. I once gave a commencement address that was entitled, Don't Be Realistic. Because so many times when we think about social change, when we think about a vision of a green future with walkable cities, people will say to us, oh, that's not realistic. And I can't think of how many times in my life people have said that to, them, to me. And our athletes often say that. I just was in Washington last week with Caroline Gleick, who skied down Mount Everest last uh, climbing season, climbed up and skied down. And she told the story of how when she was a child growing up a girl, and a very small girl, she's about five feet tall now, people said, she said she wanted to be a mountaineer, and people said, oh, that's, real, realist, you know, that's ridiculous, be realistic, you know, become a nurse, right? So all of the great people in the world who have done amazing, important things, whether it's Gandhi or Edmund Hillary or whoever it is, they're all people who refuse to be realistic. And I think that's, that would be my key message. And how you figure out what the intervention is, it could be civil disobedience, but it, it could be uh, striking. And that's just one last thing I want to say. Um, my grandmother was a union organizer. She went, came to America as an immigrant. She never went to university. And now I'm a Harvard professor. And how did that happen? Well, my grandmother was an organizer for the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union in Chicago. And their main instrument was the strike. Because how were a group of poor, uneducated workers possibly going to make change against powerful business owners who were educated, rich, had the ear of politicians, sometimes bribed politicians? And the answer for them was the strike. And strikes were, have been an incredibly powerful tool in the history of the United States, England, Europe, across the globe, also in India under Gandhi, in order to show and to demonstrate that people do have power and that people can bring certain kinds of activities to a halt until certain demands are made. And, that, and they can be completely law-abiding. They, they can and should be nonviolent. Um, but a nonviolent act of striking can be very powerful. So to me, it's very exciting that young people are striking. And I encourage you to continue to do so. Thank you, Naomi. Ellie. Um, I wanted to build on the disruption point. I think that definitely we don't want to be violent. I think that violence is one thing that we never want to turn to, especially because we want to be involving as many people as possible. We don't want to be hurting people in our aim to save people. Um, I think as someone who has done activism, it's really difficult to find the line on how disruptive you should be because you have to make that balance between disrupting people's lives but also getting them on your side. And so when that line crosses into your, you know, making people feel isolated from your movement, it is really harmful because obviously we want a diverse set of opinions but also we want to be um, involving people into the movement because in the end we're fighting for everyone. And so I agree that we should not be realistic, definitely. Um, and I also agree that we need to disrupt to an extent, but I don't think we should take it too far to the point where we isolate people or we cause any damage on people in the long term. And to touch on the point about companies and trying to t take steps towards sustainability, I think it's hard as often media is not very honest, and obviously companies have the incentive to portray themselves in the best light possible. So it's very difficult for individuals to trust companies when they say they're doing all these great things. Um, I mean, you look at H&M, for example. They are a well-known fast fashion company who have now created a sustainable line. Um, I agree that this is a great step forward, but when they brand everything as sustainable, they are missing a huge part of their background, which is fast fashion, which can cause worker exploitation and environmental issues. And so, though I agree we should be encouraging companies 
to do these sustainable acts and that we should believe that they are doing them. I don't think it's necessarily a negative thing when people hold them accountable for things they're not doing or take what they say with a grain of salt. Uh, Excellent, thank you, Ellie. And Gabby? Okay, so I think I'm gonna try answer the first question. So I mean, personally, I've come across uh, lots of people who kind of understand that climate change is happening, but uh, refuse to do anything to act. So that goes from anywhere from like my friends to people who managed to find uh, my follow my Twitter account with only 30 followers. But anyway, so um, make the plug for your Twitter handle now. Um, oh, it's Gab Strikes Again. So you just doubled your followers. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, but I found like <laughs> the best way for us to overcome that is to present them with examples, facts, like pictures <coughs> of what our future is going to be like and how that's going to affect, uh, affect their lives and the things they love and then they get on board pretty quickly. And then building on kind of what Ellie said, I think it's really important not to forget what we're fighting for as well, which is to um, like a just and sustainable and viable future for everyone. And so rather than drawing a divide between people who act and people who don't, um, it's important to incorporate everyone's voices and like all strive toward a system where people are free and people are free to make like any decisions they want about the way they consume and the way they vote and yeah. So building a system that includes everyone is important as well. Excellent, thank you very much indeed. My apologies, we've overrun, but uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking Gabby, Ellie, Naomi, Victoria, Nick, Anne, and Georgia.